The story I'm going to tell you came from a man named Tommy Hicks. Anybody ever heard of that name, Tommy Hicks? A few. Uh, this is a three-page article in Oral Roberts magazine. And it says, I saw three million people bow before God. Uh, this man either had the greatest revival in the world or in history or very close to it. Uh, he went to Argentina because God told him to go. Just got up and went down there, didn't know a soul. Went and sat in a hotel room and said, now God, what shall I do? And, uh, and God told him what to do. The president, and here in this article, of course you don't have a copy of it anyway, but in this article here, he couldn't even tell it was the president Peron because Peron was still alive. And he respected his office as the president of a nation and didn't, but he was dying of cancer. God told him so. He marched right up to the guards and said, God called me to speak to the president and talked his way into a palace. That's very unusual for you to be able to do that. But he, he laid hands upon this man and God healed him. And the man called in the press and said, give him the largest auditorium in the nation. It seated over 100,000 people. And he said to the newspapers, give him front page every day. And he had up to 100,000 people, over 100,000 people in each service. And he saw over 3 million people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he went to Russia. Now, I knew him quite well. I'll tell you that into the story. I knew him quite well. And, and uh, he has preached in our city on two or three uh, different occasions. And he told this story in this city and we taped it. And, and so you're not listening to something second-handed. You're listening to something that comes directly. You see? But I only want you to know that Oral Roberts wouldn't have been putting three whole pages in his magazine if he hadn't believed in it, you see. And, and so uh, we're not dealing with, 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 a, with a myth. We're dealing with the truth. And the man told this story uh, in, in, in this city. And, and that, that, that's the way I came into it, directly from his lips. I took him out, went down to the hotel where we were keeping him, and uh, we talked to him by the hour. And, and uh, this, this story went straight every time. And so we, we're, we're telling you something that, that's factual and that I believe in it. And it's the most terrifying thing I ever come up against in my life. Now to you, 50 or 60 that just came in uh, since I've been talking, uh, we're teaching out of a very important syllabus that sells for $10. Uh, it's called Dreams and Visions of Bible and Prophecy. You cannot go into the bookstore and ask for a discount because it's $10 in there and they don't do that. They just sell everything at the regular price. And, uh, but if you want one in here, to follow this story. You will not be able to follow this story. You cannot follow this story with your ears. Uh, and, and if you don't have a pencil and mark the story as we go, when we get through with it, you won't have half of it. And possibly half you have won't be right. And, and so uh, uh, we, we want you to get the story. And if you'd like one of these uh, uh, right now for just $5, I'll usher, you have to hold your hand up high. Our ushers will serve you instantly. And, and uh, then you can have the story. Uh, this is a great syllabus for all you pastors to preach out of beginning, beginning in the first page of it. The, the modern, much of the modern church is dubious about the supernatural, especially when it is manifested through a dream or a vision. Uh, they are afraid of deceptions, uh, counterfeits, or spiritual misguidance. I believe that visitors, I bet that visions and dreams must be tested say tested, uh, by spiritual leadership, the same as spiritual gifts. Prophetically, it is time, say time, for many remarkable manifestations of the supernatural to take place. I believe this. Only those who are spiritually tuned in will be able to get the message of the last days. And, and so that's the introduction 
on, on page six. Uh, not, not of what I'm going to preach about today, but of this whole teaching syllabus. Uh, brethren, I've met men that were young preachers, and I said, where do you get all your material to preach? And they grin at me a little bit, and they turn around in their chair, and I look, and they've got maybe 20 or 25 different teaching syllabus that I have. And, and uh, you say, how does it make you feel? Oh, wonderful. Uh, and it's all laid out exactly like a sermon. You don't have to do a thing, but take it point by point uh, through, through it. And you're welcome to secure these and, and, uh, and to use them in, in any way the Lord wants you to use them. We feel that truth is truth, and really you can't copyright truth. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God, and so you know business copywriting God's, God's work. And, and, and so uh, uh, we want you to use it. And especially this one here would be good when it comes to dreams and visions of the, uh, the last days. And as you see there on, on page six, God promised his people that he would speak to them. And Numbers 12 and six, it says, hear, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Jehovah, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. And, and so beginning in the time of Moses, God began to do this. But then you come through to the book of Joel, and he says that in the last days, this is what is going to take place. So we are now dealing with, with, with prophecy in relation to this, and we are dealing with the last days in relation to this. And we just wanted to get down in, inside of you. Now, I, I think I'm ready. I feel sorry for those that are coming in late that they will not get the same thing that you got. And they, of course, will not be able to follow it. They can get a tape and play it back, but even that will be different than when you mark yours. Get your pencil out and mark it. Uh, since this morning, I've been in my office and I have marked mine all over again as if somebody else did it uh, because it's, it seems so interesting just, just to, to mark it up. On page 48, it says, Tommy Hicks, a friend of mine for several years, I wanted to tell you, he went to Russia from, from down there in, in Argentina where he had this great revival. Now, we were so intimately related to this thing until, you see, my wife lived there for over seven years. I met her in, in, in Argentina. I met my wife in Argentina in the same city that he had that great revival. And, and she knew how difficult it was to get anything across to those Argentines and how difficult it was to build a church. But after this revival, anybody, everybody could have a church as big as you want to build the thing. This, this revival he had broke that nation free and, and, and millions of people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But this vision here is going to change all of your thinking about the future. And I want to go into it and, and take you through it uh, very, very slowly. So th th that is up in, in your in introduction there, uh, that he can conducted this, this great Argentine revival, and God gave him a, vi a vision of the end time, a vision of the prophecy, end time ministry. Then in point number one there, it says Tommy Hicks uh, said to me personally and to my church that this vision began July the 25th, about 2.30 in the morning, and, and, and that's a very strange thing. Did you know that almost every night of my life I wake up at 2.30 in the morning? There won't be one night out of seven or eight that I don't wake up at 2.30 in the morning. I don't know whether that's a meeting time with God or night, but many of the things that I write, I write them between 2.30 and 6.30 in the morning. Sometimes I go back and have a 30-minute rest or something or another, but normally that's a beautiful time. And, and, and for you, nutty little people, to go buy a bunch of junk at the drugstore to put you to sleep, that's the stupidest thing in the world. When you don't sleep, shout praise the Lord and grab your Bible and start reading it out loud. Brother, you'll go to sleep in the next 10 verses. The, the, the devil will put you to sleep because he don't want you reading that Bible, you know. I've never in my life taken anything. Well, I don't take anything anyway, but I wouldn't take anything. When I lie down and don't go to sleep, I start shouting and praising God, rejoicing in God, and, and jump up and begin to write books and to write articles and so forth. And, and I get so happy about it, I don't know what to do till I get sleepy. 
and I lay down and I can go to sleep in about five to six seconds. And very often, when my wife and I are getting ready for bed at the same time, by the time she snaps the light out, it's all finished. She talks, but nobody answers back. He said, I'm already gone. I'm the best sleeper you've ever looked at in your life. But, but this thing happened to him at 2.30 in the morning, and I thought that was very significant. Now, you'll notice under that point one, the vision came to him three times. They were exactly the same in all three times, in every detail. And they happened on the 25th, 26th, 27th of July. He says, I was so stirred and so moved by the revelation uh, that this has changed my complete outlook upon the body of Christ, upon the body of Christ. His very best friends did not relate to this thing at all. And he saw their faces in, in, the, in the vision that the Lord gave him. And his best friends did not relate to the blessing of God, nor, nor to the power of God. He said, I was so stirred and so moved by the revelation that it changed my complete outlook upon the body of Christ. Now, that's what we're going to work on this afternoon. The body of Christ and upon the end time ministry. The greatest gifts that the church of Jesus Christ has ever been given, they lie right straight ahead of us. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? Brother, we're not behind the times. We're, we're leading the crowd. Uh, all the mighty power of God, more than has ever been demonstrated before, is right straight out in front of us. And if we'll keep moving in a straight line, you're going to find the demonstration of the mighty power of God in your life. It is difficult to help men and women to realize what God is trying to give to his people in this time. You might as well stop, you know. There's no need of trying to tell people, this is what God's going to do, this is what God's going to do. They just, you know, they're so consumed with a red automobile or a pink dress until they just don't have time to, to, to understand. And, and as, as this thing starts maturing here, you'll see, you'll see that the multitudes of people are so, are so taken up with the things of this world, they are not ready for spiritual revelation. They're not ready for a divine revelation. Uh, he, he said, it is difficult for me to help men and women to realize what God is trying to give his people in the end time. It is still difficult. It is still difficult. And your point number two there, it says, I did not fully uh, realize or could I understand the fullness of this vision until I read in the book of Joel 2.23. Be glad, children of Zion, Rejoice in Jehovah your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will, he will cause you to come down from, from, for you the rain, the former rain, and also the latter rain in the first month. Uh, he says not only will God send the former rain and the latter rain, but he is going to give his people a double portion. Say double portion. He's going to give his people a double portion of the power of God in these last days. Are you ready for it? I believe we're so near to it. I feel very strange about this camp meeting that we're having here. I, I, I just feel like God's going to do something here that we're going to look back and say, I was there when that thing happened. You know, and, and I want you to get your spirits ready for it. Get your souls ready for it and let God do something very particular in your, in your own heart. All right, in the next paragraph, when this vision appeared to Tommy Hicks, he says, I suddenly found myself at a great height. So now in this vision, he was not in his room, but he was up above the earth and he was looking down upon the earth. He was at a great height. He says, I, I was looking upon the earth when suddenly the whole world came into my view. Every nation, every kindred, every tongue came before my sight. Uh, from the east, the west, the north, the south, I recognized the countries and cities that I had been in preaching, of course. He says, I was almost in fear and trembling as I stood beholding the great sight before me. At that moment, but when the world came into view, I, I began to see lightning 
and to hear it thunder. It, be, it, it began to lightning and thunder. Now, that speaks to us of the end time, the lightning and the thunder. And uh, he says it, it was so great that it frightened him. It just frightened him. It was so great. Then in your A under there, the great giant, this is the beginning now of this thing. As the lightning flashed over the face of the earth, my eyes went downward. I was facing the north. And suddenly I beheld, I beheld and what looked like a great giant. Now that giant is the church. We're dealing with the church today. That giant, like a great giant. As I stared at it, I was almost bewildered by the sight. The giant was gigantic. His feet seemed to reach to the North Pole and his head to the South Pole. That reveals to you that the church is universal, that it does cover the whole earth, and that it is a great giant. You know, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know of no place on the face of this earth but what the church is not there. You cannot keep it away. You can be Chinese and kill Christians and, and, and chase them all you want to. They'll go underground and multiply faster than you've ever dreamed people could multiply. You cannot extinguish the light that Jesus started at Calvary. Hallelujah! <laughs> that is not possible. The giant was gigantic. His feet reached to the North Pole, his head to the South Pole. His arms stretched from sea to sea. I could not even begin to understand whether this was a mountain or whether this was a giant. But as I watched, I realized it was a great giant. It's the church. I could see he was struggling for life, even to live. Now, mark that with your pencil there or hold your finger on it. Did you know that most of the church in this world is struggling to live right now? There are many great churches. I was in New York, and our brother is here from New York City with us right now. And uh, I, I, I was driven by the, uh, the great tabernacle there, Riverside Tabernacle. And, and we were discussing it together. The one time it was full of uh, very wealthy millionaires. And it may, it may still be, it has a struggle to have enough people to stay alive, to be a church. It has a struggle to stay alive. You, you go to many of the great churches, and when I say great, I mean buildings, of course, or denominations, and they can't hardly live today. They don't get enough people to pay their expenses. Now this is worse over in Europe. In, in the state churches of Norway and Sweden and, and Denmark, and, Germany, where they have these giant state churches. They have so few people in them, they hardly have church. And if the government didn't pay the salary of the preacher, they close the doors. The government pays the salary in these state churches of, of, of the preachers. And so if they don't even have church, they still get their salary. It don't, it don't matter either way. But he says, this giant here was struggling for life even to live, you know, even to live. Now you're you're inside uh, and wherever you're, you're worshiping in the best churches in the world. You see, you come from the, they may not be a, you know, a, a $50 million building, but you've got Jesus there. You've got the power of God there. You've got the anointing of God there. And right down the street is some big first church that don't have 50 people out on a Sunday morning. He says the church was struggling even to live. His body, I want you to mark this real carefully. His body was covered with debris. Here a man was seeing a vision of the church. And this creature called the church, struggling to live, about to die. And his body was covered with garbage. His body was covered with garbage. Imagine these great churches in America where homosexuals are invited in the pulpit to preach. Can you imagine that? It, 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 you can't hardly believe it, you know? In many churches, they, they have to get the preacher, uh, uh, send him to a hospital to get alcohol out of him several times. He so, has become a drunkard and, and they, they have to get alcohol out of him. 
We are living in a very special moment of time. And we're not going to be carried away with it either. We're not going to be deceived by it. And for God's sake, we're not going to try to emulate it. We got, a, we got our own way of worshiping God, and we're not about ready to quit. In Jesus' name. His body was just covered with debris from head, head to foot. Can you imagine a church with every, go over to the junkyard and see that mess? That's what the church looks like. That's, that is if you're up there looking down on the earth and God's talking to you. A filthy creature. The church, the denominations become a filthy creature covered with every kind of sin. Covered with every kind of filth. And struggling his very best just to stay alive. It says his body was covered with, with debris and at times this great giant would move in his body and act as if he would rise up. I see that's when Billy Graham would come to town. And all these filthy churches would say, yeah, we're joined with you. And so they learned how to sing in his choir, 500. And then they put those dirty men as ushers walking up and down the aisles of Billy Graham's great meeting. And the church, the Bible says, trying to rise up, trying to be something, trying to act like it's alive. There's so much of that in our world today, trying to be something it's not. The good things of God come from the inside of you and not from the outside. Goodness is an interior operation and not something you powder on like powder on the outside. He tried to rise up and when he did, now this is what hurts me the most of everything I have to say. When the giant would try, please mark these carefully, mark them up and down, put notes everywhere you can. When he did, thousands of little creatures seemed to run away underneath that big thing called the church for demon spirits. Can you imagine that? A man of God having such a vision as that. Little demons, unbelief, doubt, jealousy, adultery, stealing, lying, evil spirits nesting, nesting, nesting in the church, making a nest there. And then when a great evangelist come by and, and shook hell, these little demons said, we better run away. And so they would run away. This is what he says. They were hideous looking creatures. And they would run away from this giant. And when he would become calm, you know, after the last day of the revival. And they settled back to what they were. It says they would all come back. They would all come back. You don't know how many times I've read that. Maybe 50 times, you see. And after God sent something great and mighty, the church wanted to do something or be something, but it didn't get changed on the inside. And then all the filth of the thing came back again. Every sin that you've got in this country is inside the church today. I don't mean the body of Christ. I mean the, the corporate church. The, the, the church that these denominations claim, you know, to be their church. They'd come back. Your B point, all of a sudden, this great giant lifted up one hand toward heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Now, there, there was nothing outside to that. There was nobody coming to town to carry on a revival for that. And all of a sudden, he saw this church lift up one hand toward heaven. And then it lifted up the other hand toward heaven. And when it did, these creatures, these little demon spirits, by the thousands seemed to flee away from this giant and to go into the darkness and into the night. I want you to know that the church can be saved. 
It don't matter where it is. It don't matter what's there. It don't matter how much filth the devil's poured in upon the thing. You raise one hand to heaven, and then you raise the other hand to heaven, and the devil say, hey, I better get out of here. I better get out of here. He's pointing the wrong direction now. He's pointing up and not down. He's not pointing out. He's pointing up. And we better be leaving. And he, and he says, they went into the dark. Slowly, this great giant began to rise. And as he did, his head and hands went into the clouds. His hands lifted, his head lifted. You say, what do you mean, Brother Sumrall? This is an end time prophecy. The dead church is going to rise and the filth is going to come out of the church. I don't mean the Pentecostal church. I mean out of all of the churches and we're going to see a revival that will stun this world. We expect the priests in Russia to get saved and to stop the abominations that they've been in for over a thousand years. We expect the superstitions to get out of them and the truth of the word of God to come inside. Hallelujah! There is no hopeless situation in this world unless you let it be hopeless. His head and hands went into the air. He rose to his feet and he seemed to have cleansed himself from the filth, this debris that was upon top of him. And he began to raise his hands into the heavens as though praising the Lord. And as he raised his hands, they went even into the clouds. The church is so big. I don't think any of us will ever realize how great the church is in this earth and how the devil hates it. And now here's one of the great things that, of the whole talk. It says, suddenly, every cloud became silver. Now, now take, take, take a little... Uh, make a little circle around that word silver. You might want to study it uh, in, 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 the days, in the days ahead of you. It was the most beautiful silver that I've ever seen. That's something. The most beautiful silver I've ever seen. And as I watched the phenomenon, it was so great, I could not even begin to understand what it all meant. I was so stirred. As I watched it, I cried under the Lord and I said Lord what is the meaning of this and it and it felt as if I were actually in the spirit now, 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 now Tommy was a good preacher but he was not a theologian preacher he, he was an exhorter a type of preacher that lived close to the word of God he says it seems actually what he really is trying to say he's like a translated person like Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration I felt as I were actually in the spirit and I could feel the presence of the Lord. He's, he's trying to tell you that he became something that he wasn't normally. Then your C point. Suddenly, from those clouds, spiritual clouds, there came great drops of liquid light. Put, put a circle around those two. Liquid light. It, it'd be interesting to, uh, to have a scientist to study that for us. And to, and to take us back in, into, into the philosophy of light becoming a liquid, a liquid becoming a light, you see? Uh, uh, drops of liquid light, and they were raining down, raining down upon this giant. So here's this thing that got up by itself. You can come to God, you don't, you don't need anybody else. Lifted its own hands, lifted its own head, the demon spirits got out and left. And, and when it did, the, this liquid light began to come down on the giant. Slowly, this giant began to melt. Now, now, now the old traditional church is going to be gone off the face of this earth. God's had about 2,000 years of that mess and he's sick and tired of it. Slowly, the giant began to melt. It began to sink downward as it were, into the very earth itself. And as it melted, his whole form seemed to have melted upon the face of this earth. So, uh, religion as we know it, denominational religion as we know it, commercial religion as, as, as we know it, uh, it's going to melt. It's going to go out of the way. It's going to die. 
The Bible, the Bible is going to tell us a lot more about that. And as it melted, his whole form seemed to have melted upon the face of the earth. This great rain came down upon him. Liquid, liquid drops of light. And it's a phenomenon, you see. Liquid drops of light melted that big old giant. Oh, we know what light is? It's the word of God. You know, it's the word of God. And, and uh, liquid word comes down upon that creature that's supposed to be a, a religion and, and, and a church Com comes down upon him. And it says, as it came down upon him, suddenly this giant that seemed to melt became millions of people over the face of the earth. That is that structure of religiosity melted down then the people became free from it, you see, as, as it melted down. And suddenly the giant seemed to melt, became millions of people over the face of the earth. And as I beheld the sight before me, people, now, 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 underline it, people stood up all over the world. This next great revival that could be beginning right now will be totally all over the face of this earth. It will not be located in just one country. It's going to be totally all over the world. They were lifting up their hands and they were praising God, praising the Lord. I just want you to know the next mighty revival will be a praise revival. Don't ever lose your praise. Don't ever let the devil slow you down. If he calls you fanatic, tell him that you're a Holy Ghost one. And that you're not ashamed of it because the next great revival is going to be wrapped up in mighty praises hallelujah, hallelujah. It's going to be wrapped up in mighty praises if you don't like praises i just want to assure you it's time to learn to like them it's time to get into them because it's time to praise the lord in jesus name now you you are at d at that very moment there came a great thunder. Now, now, in the end of time, you read the book of Revelation, and there was thunder, and there were lightnings. And that means the cosmos is going to come into perfect harmony with the Spirit of God. And it's going to obey God and to fulfill His Word upon the face of this earth. There was a great thunder that seemed to roar from the heavens. I turned my eyes toward the heavens, and suddenly I saw a figure in glistening white who was he the most glorious being I've ever seen in my life I did not see the face you see you you you, you have to read that in the Bible where, where where in his glorified state God didn't want you to see his face Jesus didn't want the people to see his face but we're gonna see him face to face when we get to heaven because we should be like him and all the people said but somehow I knew that it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He stretched forth his hand to, to one and to another and unto another. It's Jesus who owns the church. It's his church. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is the one, it says of these millions of people that after it had thundered, that the Lord Jesus Christ stretched forth his hand toward this one and that one and another one and as he stretched his hand upon the people and the nations of the world men and women he do things we're well, you going to see that that's exactly what was going to happen F says I was bewildered he was he wasn't a smart aleck he said I was bewildered as I watched these people whom he Jesus had anointed they began to cover the earth now that's what I'm believing with all my heart right now I'm believing that in Leningrad, we're going to scream in Russian, go and tell. We're going to say within one hour, when you're out of this Colosseum, tell at least 10 people about Jesus. At least 10 people about Jesus. About Jesus. Now the people of Russia don't have nice homes. If you got married today and asked the government for a, an, an apartment, they put your name down and smile at you and say, honey, be back in 10 years. Your time will come up if you have patience. 
I've been, I've been in homes of pastors. You walk up the stairs there, and the right is a bedroom. There's one bed. You see how many people sleep in this room? They say 12. How do you do it? They reach underneath the bed and pull out a little old thing there that they can, that they can lay on. You'd call it a pallet, I suppose. Mom and Papa sleeps up there, and the whole rest of the family sleep on the floor. In the daytime, little children come and lie down on the bed just to see what it feels like if they ever have a chance to lay on one. They have another room over there. They cook, and another room they, they have that they eat in, and, and, and that's all the government has given them. And he was 10 or 12 years getting that, had no place at all, you see. No wonder. I'm surprised they don't have a revolution over there and 30 million of them die in the streets killing each other for the way they've been treated by the communists during these last 72 years. It's a terrible thing. What I'm trying to tell you is they don't have anything precious anyway. Those people will run throughout that whole nation preaching this gospel because they don't have anything left behind anyway. And that's what Jesus is going to do just before he comes. And those people that haven't had a bed in the last 30 years, you're not going to get one in heaven. They're going to make you sleep on the floor, and they'll sleep on the bed. You better get off your water beds. I was bewildered. These people whom he had anointed, they covered the earth. Brother, don't tell me this is going to be little. You're going to be used. Lay people have a lot more to do it than preachers will. This is a, this is a revival for everybody, for every human. Can you, can you say amen? amen? There were hundreds of thousands. Think of it. This little man was looking down in his vision at them. Hundreds of thousands of these people. And they were all over the world. Remember, he was up above the earth looking down upon it. They were in Africa, Asia. They were in Russia. They were in China. They were in America. The anointing of God was upon these people as they went forth in the name of the Lord. Now, you want to stick with that. Put a line under it there because we're going to keep bearing down on that in, in, in the next few minutes. As they went forth in the name of the Lord, there were ditch diggers. Uh, there were people. There were women that were washerwomen. There were the rich. There were the poor. I saw people who were bound by paralysis, all kinds of sickness, blindness, deafness. And as the Lord stretched forth his hand to give them this anointing, they became well they became healed and they went forth in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 If you think the future is dull, <laughs> ooh, if you think Ben Hinn's funny, and he is funny, you know, I feel sorry for the people that go to an auditorium that they have metal chairs. He sometimes breathes upon a whole section. <laughs> And the whole mess goes down, five or six hundred, backwards onto the floor at one time. With nobody to catch them except iron chairs. Yeah. And, and so, just want you to know that we are in the beginning of the beginning. And only the informed will be able to, 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 to deal with it. These poor people in the Pentecostal denomination will write their headquarters, what shall we do about it? And those backsliders are down there will say, don't contaminate yourself with it. It's fanaticism. You say, why? Because they don't know anything about it. Don't be ignorant. I'm one of the only persons that you've ever looked at that's been in every revival of this century, not as an observer, but inside. Shouting, praising, rejoicing in God in that revival. And I expect to be in the next one too. Hallelujah. In 18 months from right now, I'll be 80, 80 years old. I can't help looking 58. Living 48. Reaching back for 38, you know. You say, why? I don't want something like this to happen and I'm, on a, I, I'm walking around with a cane. I might hurt somebody hitting them with it. You know? So I don't, don't want don't to get like that. I want to be just like Moses. I want to be strong in the Lord till the day I go to heaven. And some of you older people, you ought to re remember that, that Moses didn't get started till he was 80. 
And then hope for some of you old ones out there. You know, some of you men need to get some black stuff and dye your hair and start over again. And uh, there's a lot of good things to do on this earth. In the first 40 years of Moses' life, he lived in a palace. He ate so much good food, he had to go through a door sideways. God says, you're not in shape. He sent him out in the desert, took hot sand and rubbed him down for 40 years and got all that stuff off of him. Then he says, now you're 80, I can use you. And he said, I want you to go set my people free. And for the third 40 years, he led them through the hot sands of the desert into the promised land, you see, till he was 120 years old. That's a nice age, isn't it? And he walked up that mountain without any help, just climbed that thing by himself. And from the top of that mountain, he and God had a little ceremony together. And, and God says, I'm going to take care of these bones for you. The devil is standing by and he growls, I'll get them. And he says, we'll let Michael take care of you, son. And you read in the book of Jude there that, that he, he, he said, the Lord rebuke you. And he was rebuked. And, and he couldn't steal Moses' bones. What in the world would the devil want with bones 120 years old? I guess he'd want to make Moses soup out of them. I don't know. <laughs> but that wouldn't make him like Moses, I can tell you that. Can you say amen? amen? The great days for the church are ahead. You're going to see it. We're going along here. He says, I saw all kinds of people, poor little ladies, that had to go out and wash clothes. They don't do much of that anymore. And, and they were rich men and poor men. And, and they were all there. And he stretched forth his hand and gave them this anointing. And they became well, they became healed, and they went forth. This is the miracle of it. The, the glorious miracle of it. Those people, those people would stretch, would stretch forth their hands exactly, put a little circle there, exactly as Jesus did. And it seemed this same liquid fire was in their hands also, that liquid light. And as they stretched forth their hands, they said, according to my word, be thou made whole. They were so full of Jesus, the same words of Jesus, saying according to my word was coming out of their lips, speaking for the Lord and not for themselves. According to my word, be thou made whole. I did not fully realize what was happening. I looked to the Lord and I said, what's the meaning of this? He said, this is that which I will do in the last days. Say the last days. I will restore all that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar have destroyed. Their, their philosophies, their programs. We got Pentecostal people in this country that have dancing classes. They call it art. And they have young women on the platform dressed in long pieces of, of, of silk and they stand up there and act out the singing. And someone said to me, says, isn't that beautiful? And I said, no, that's not beautiful, but I can make it beautiful. They said, how? I said, find every old 75-year-old man and let him do it. Oh, they said, that wouldn't be pretty. Then it's the lust of the flesh. You want to see a pretty girl's body. And you won't put an old man 75 years old up there and let him dance for you. Are you here? In Pentecostal churches, they don't know the difference between the lust of the flesh and, 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 and dancing in the spirit. Dancing in the spirit is beautiful. But I want you to know that messing around, throwing your arms around and your body around and, and jumping around is not pretty. It is not pretty even in a tavern, much less in a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is getting closer to the devil every day and don't know it. They don't realize it. They say, isn't it pretty? We're not doing pretty things. We're doing strong things these days. We're setting, we're setting at liberty those that are bruised. You'll see tonight in this building, people set free in their minds. I mean, you'll see it. God will snap it inside. 
because that's all that's going to be preached about tonight with Ed Dufresne. That, that the setting the mind free. Setting the mind free. He's going to tell you how his mother was sent to an insane asylum and she made one mistake that snapped her mind. You see? And he had to live with that. He knows all about it personally. And, and we need to hear it tonight. Don't be making wrong decisions. Let us make right decisions. Let us make spiritual decisions. And let us rebuke the devil. Hallelujah. And all the people said. Amen. All right. He said, this is what I will do in, in the last days. I will restore all that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar. I have a sermon on that, but I can't give it today. And, and this is my people. This my people in the last time shall go forth. They shall go forth as a mighty army and they shall sweep over the face of the earth. Now that's the revival I want to see. That God's people sweep over the total face of the earth pointing at people and they're healed say so receive it in Jesus name Amen. there won't be any more healing lines that that'll all be finished where people of unbelief want you to give them a half a way massage you know it'll all be over with the power of God is going to be present and if you're open for it and ready for it one point of the finger and you have it T.L. Osborne has held those tremendous meetings on mission fields, has never had a healing line in his life. Those people are healed thereby. He speaks healing to them, and those that have faith grab it, and they've got it. He does no counseling with people who don't understand what God's doing, because all he can do is rebuke them for not listening, you see. A pastor doesn't have to do a lot of counseling in the church. If you will come and listen to the Word of God and sit down front and listen to the Word of God, you won't need counseling. The Holy Ghost will counsel you even while he's preaching. That's right. And you'll know what to do. Normally people that counsel, they want you to tell them that they're right in their rebellion. That's what they've done. And, and they're just looking for somebody to agree with them. And, and so you don't have to have it. You believe me, you don't, you don't have to have it. There are millions of people being counseled in every way in the world in this country. And some counselors are making a lot of money at trying to pry into your private life. And their private life's worse than yours. All right, we're at G uh, on, on page 51. As I was at a great height, you see he hadn't come down yet. I could behold the whole world and I watched these people as they were going to and fro over the face of the earth, a man from Africa would be transported. Now, now, now this is going to be a glory age, just like Philip was moved over 20 miles on a second time uh, in, in, in the New Testament. He says they would be transported in a moment by the Spirit of God, maybe to Russia or China or America or someplace or vice versa. These people went all over the world and they came through fire and pestilence and famine, neither fire nor persecution, nothing seemed to stop these people. Amen. Hey, that, that's revival, isn't it? That's what you want to see, isn't it? Amen. You've been taught for so long, we want to see it now. And that's the reason I said this could be the most important meeting of your life today. You could come and dedicate and rededicate, consecrate, reconsecrate. To the most high God and say God I want to be in the last army and I want you just to point at me and I'll have the fire liquid fire the light the liquid light that I'll be able to take it from your hand and point it at somebody else and miracles and miracles take place oh hallelujah let's worship the Lord together raise your hands and let's worship the Lord Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Gila bakashaka babahata. Gila rada batiba bahashika babahasia. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Praise God. Now, in number eight, if you wanted to write a little word there, you could say reaction. It says angry men. You could put the word reaction out there. Angry mobs came to these anointed ones. They came with swords, guns, and like Jesus, they passed through the multitude 
of, and, and they faced the multitude, the men could not find them. Uh, the, the consecrated ones went everywhere, stretching forth their hands in the name of the Lord. Uh, when they would speak and say those words, the sick were healed, blind eyes were opened. There was not a long prayer. I put a circle around that. I have a circle around mine. We're coming to the end of long prayers, you know. The only place Jesus prayed long prayers was in the closet. When he healed people, he just said, be healed, and that's all there was to it. He said to the devil, come out, and that's all there was to that too. And these people that have long prayers are always prayers of unbelief. I never saw a church. That's a building. Never saw a church building. I never saw or heard of a word called denomination. These people were going in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts. They marched. They marched forward as the, as, as, the, as the minister of Christ in the end time. And they ministered to the multitudes over the face of the earth. Tens of thousands, even millions, seemed to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as these people stood forth in this last hour and they gave the message of the coming kingdom that his kingdom would come when everybody would be happy, everybody would have everything that they needed. They preached the kingdom message. You could write out a little beside that if you wanted to, the kingdom message. It was so glorious. It seemed, it seemed there were those that rebelled. They, they would become angry and they tried to attack these workers that had the miracle power in them. Uh, they, they were giving the message. So there will be reaction. Uh, and that I think is normal. That the people that don't have it will get mad at those that do have it, you see. And so there will be there will be a reaction, and then you come to the eye point. God is going to give the world a demonstration in this last hour, such as has never been known before. Now, how many believe that? Yeah, yeah, I believe we're in not for just a good one, the big one. That, that we're not going to have a good meeting, we're going to have a big one. That we're going to see the greatest thing God has ever done. That he has never done in history what he is going to do. We've got more people living now than ever lived before at one time. Five billion, three hundred million humans on this little planet Earth here. And I believe we're going to have a revival where millions and then billions of them are going to get saved. Can you say amen? amen. And, and so uh, these men and women, all of all walks of life, Degrees will mean nothing. I, I saw these workers as, as they were going over the face of the earth. When one would seem to stumble and fall, another would quickly come and pick him up. Won't that be a great day? And th there would be no big I or little you attitude. Every mountain was brought low. Every valley was exalted. And, and they seemed to have one thing in common. A divine love. A divine love. A divine love. A divine love that flowed forth from these people as they went together. Now, now I don't know whether you've heard about it, but uh, uh, in Indonesia, when they had that great revival there, th that's the way they went. They went to another village. It wasn't the preacher that went off over there. The whole church went. The whole church went. How many heard those stories? Yeah, I don't know where you can find them in print or not, but, but, but they are stories. They'd come to a river and had no way to get across. And the leader would say, let's go, everybody. And they walked right straight across the top of that river on dry land right on top of it. They just, they just walked across on the top of the water. And, and you, you can't tell a thousand people they're liars. They all walked across together. And, and when they went to raise the dead, uh, they'd gather around the person that had died and they'd ask God one question. God, has this person lived out their full length of days or has the devil stolen some days? The Lord said, this person has not lived out their, their days. The devil has stolen. They said, then we'll take it back. Amen. Yeah. And they'd speak to the dead and say, dead, hear my voice and go. And I command our friend and call their name. You come back. They only did it one time. And they, they held hands and began to sing. And they would sing until he got up and joined them. And, and, and hundreds were raised from the dead, not two or three. Hundreds were raised from the dead. But that only happened in a certain area of Java, you see. It, it, didn't, it didn't happen in other places. But there was a people that got themselves together with the right spirit. 
not loving the material things that they all ate together. They didn't, one man have his, another person had that. They, they would eat together. They put all their money together. It was just like the first church in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and it's very likely it's going to be like that again just before Jesus comes. That nobody will say, this is mine or that's mine. They'll say, let's all go get them. And the, the big thing in our lives will be getting the world saved and getting the world healed. And all the people said, and so uh, under your eye uh, there, uh, it, it says they live together, they, they work together. It was the theme of their lives. And as the days went by, I stood and behold the sights. I could only cry. I, I'm sure of that. And sometimes I would laugh. It was so wonderful as these people went throughout the earth. Now he was up above the earth looking down upon the earth watching these people. They went face on the whole earth showing forth God's power in this last time. Showing forth God's power. Are you excited about it? Yeah. Be all right, just read this every day if you want to. You know, showing forth God's power in this end time. Now, here comes the, the, the mighty climax of this thing, which is the greatest part. It says, this is under J. As I walked as I watched from the very heaven itself, there were times when great deluges of this liquid light seemed to fall upon great congregations. He means groups of people. The congregations would lift their hands and praise God for what seemed to be hours and it seemed to be days Hallelujah. as the Spirit of God would come upon them. And they would say, and God said, I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now that is exactly what God was doing, pouring out his spirit from every man and woman that received this power and anointing of God, the miracles of God flowed continuously, continuously, day and night. It flowed from them. Suddenly, there was another great clap of thunder. That means, that means change over now. That seemed to resound around the world. And again I heard a voice saying, Now, this is my people. This is my beloved bride. When the voice spoke, I looked upon the earth, and I could see the lakes and the mountains, and I saw the graves were open, and people from all over the world who were the saints of all ages seemed to be rising up from the earth. And as they rose from the grays, from the north to south, and they seemed to be forming again this gigantic giant, the first giant you saw, forming another giant, reaching from the North Pole to the South Pole and from ocean to ocean, forming a giant. The dead in Christ seemed to be rising first, but I could hardly comprehend it. It was so marvelous and far beyond anything I could ever have dreamed about. You see, he was as, as astonished as you are today. A humble little man. He'd cry when he'd tell me the story. And I hate him telling it a lot. I wanted to know the story. This is taken off of our record, you see, that when he preached it. Could never dream about it. Then your number L. This huge body suddenly began to form, take shape, and its shape was a form of the mighty giant, the church. But this time it was different. This giant was arrayed in beautiful, gorgeous white. <laughs> the church is going to change. Its garments were without spot or wrinkle as a body began to form and the people of all ages seemed to be gathering into this body. Slowly, from the heavens above, the Lord Jesus Christ came and he became the head on top of this body. And I heard another clap of thunder that said, this is my beloved bride for whom I have waited. She will come forth, even tried by fire. This is she whom I have loved from the beginning of time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. 
have loved from the beginning of time. See, the old church that was filthy has gone off the face of the earth. And the new church is the bride of Christ with Jesus as the head. <laughs> Beautiful and full of light since the beginning of time. As I watched, my eyes turned again to, for, to the far north. Then I saw great destruction. It's, that's the way it's going to take place, you see. All these little people running around saying there won't be any great tribulation or anything. They hadn't heard from God. They're so deep in sin they don't want the rapture to ever take place. They'd miss it anyway, you see. And I watched my eyes turn to the north I saw the destruction, buildings being destroyed, men and women crying out in anguish. Then I heard again the fourth voice that said, Now is my wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth from the ends of the whole world. It seemed that there was great vials of God's wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth. I can, I can remember it as I beheld the awful sight of seeing cities and whole nations being going down into destruction. I could hear the weeping, the wailing. I could hear the people crying. They seemed to cry as they went into caves to hide themselves. But the caves and the mountains would open up. They leaped into water, but the water would not drown them. There was nothing that would destroy them. Although they wanted to take their lives, they did not succeed. Huh. There's the two pictures, you see. There's an ungodly world. Please don't be part of it. Please don't be part of that ungodly world. I'm seeking to sanctify myself every day of my life and to a better person than I was the day before. I am not satisfied. I'm like, I'm like Paul, he says, I have not attained. But he says, I am marching forward to attain. When you think you've got it all, that's when you don't have it. When you think you're the best, that's when you're not the best. At this moment, we're reaching out and reaching up and waiting for the mighty, fully, finally outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon this world. We will not be part of that corrupt church full of devils. We just won't do it. We will not do it. We will not do it, you see. Almost all denominations on the inside are corrupt with politics, with financial messing around, with lying. And that's the only way to build themselves up is that way. We just have to keep ourselves clean inside. Keep ourselves holy inside. Keep ourselves in the Word of God. And keep ourselves ready for the final outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the face of this earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands and praise God again. Let this thing get into us. Just raise our hands and praise God again. Talk to God. Tell Him how holy you're going to be. In Jesus' name. 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 Jesus name Jesus name the Lord has put it into my spirit that a person who will not pay their tithes will not make the rapture at all no matter who you think you are and how much you think that's an Old Testament doctrine because we're coming to a time when we're not going to give 10% we're going to give it all they're going to give it all. They're all going to be one together. In the final mighty move of God, we're going to be one together. And, and uh, if you owe God money, you should, you should come across with it this afternoon and say, hey God, I'm sorry. I sinned against you. And, and maybe they're having this kind of revival already in Africa. And then we yelp away and say, we want it to come to America. Well, America, get right with God. Those people over there, they sleep on the ground. They don't, they don't have any riches. If they get a little food, they're all shouting and praising God together and sharing it together, you see. 
I want it to come to America. Can you say amen? I want our people to be saved. I want the power of God mightily, mightily demonstrated upon this earth. I'm going to tell you in a moment about Smith Wigglesworth. I'm writing it down here. All right. Now you're on page 53. You're at the one called N. He says, I return to my conscious body. He was in the spirit. He doesn't actually know in the spirit. One minute can be a thousand years or a thousand years can be a minute. So he doesn't know how long. He just knew that when he went into this operation that it was 2.30 in the morning. That's all he knew. Again, I turned my eyes toward the glorious sight of this body arrayed in a beautiful white shining garment. And it slowly, slowly, it began to fill, to lift from the earth. And as it did, I woke up. He saw the body of Christ leaving the earth with Jesus as the head of the body. And this sight that I had beheld was the end time ministry of the church. Then he says, my life has been changed. As I realized that we're living in that end time for all over the world, God is anointing men and women with this ministry. It will not be doctrines. It will not be church membership. But it is going to be Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. They will give forth the word of the Lord and they're going to say, as I heard so many times in the vision, according to my word, it shall be done. Amen. According to my word, it shall be done. We're going to be clothed with power and anointing from God. We will not have to preach sermons anymore. We will not have to depend on man, nor will we be, dominate, be denominational echoes, but we will have the power of the living God. We will fear no man, but we will go forth in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now, put a little X right there, because that's the end of what he said. Now, I'm talking to you. Soon after that vision, Tommy Hicks died in Los Angeles, California. And he went to be with the Lord. He was not permitted to see the fulfillment of the vision that God gave him. But this was true of Daniel. We are today seeing the finality of Daniel's visions. He did not see it in its fullness. Neither did Isaiah, neither did Ezekiel, neither did Jesus see the fulfillment of the prophecies that he spoke. We are seeing them today take place. Or Paul, or Peter. And so it isn't unusual that God gives a man a vision, but he gives the vision for the church. And so that the people won't worship the man, God removes him out of the way. Isn't it strange? God moves him out of the way. If this man, I heard this thing, people were so fascinating. When he'd get through, they'd all be sitting there crying. Hundreds and hundreds of people crying. If this man had stayed on the earth, he might have lost the whole vision because people would have given him so much money, he wouldn't have known how to spend it. And I got so fascinated with him. I took him down to the largest store in our city here. At that time, it was Gilbert's. I said, I want the finest top coat. He didn't even have a top coat. I want the finest top coat. And they took me my word. They should have known I was a preacher, but they didn't. <laughs> they came and tried on the most beautiful camel-haired coat I'd ever seen in my life. It was so beautiful that they didn't bring it to him like you did a regular coat. It was covered with something you could see through that so no human could touch it. It had all been hand-sewn so that a machine couldn't get close to it. They took it off the hanger. I'd never seen a coat so pretty. It just fit Tommy. He looked at me and said, can I have it? And I said, yes, sir, you can have it. He said, oh, thank God. 
I've never in my life had anything so pretty. I turned to the store owner and I said, how much is that coat? He says, Reverend, uh, says uh, to you, it's only $700. That coat would be $3,000 today. That was a few years ago. And he went walking out of there like a millionaire. He really looked, it changed the look of his face even. He was a more handsome man. And I told Gilbert, send me the bill and I'll pay it slowly. <laughs> and I did. Every time I made a payment, I said, God bless the man, Tommy Hicks, that saw the vision that could change the church. be no reason for me to take my time to do this today if it don't change you. If you're going to walk out of the building and say, ah, oh, quite a story. You shouldn't have been here. You wasted your time. But if you're here to get yourself changed, we studied last Sunday in our, in our teaching class. Some were taken and some were left. The five virgins were taken that were ready and the unwise were left. They were all virgins, but five of them wasn't ready and they got left behind. The door was shut and the bridegroom from inside said, no opening of this door. There are things that when you pass a certain mark, the door is closed. Possibly thousands of people beat on the side of Noah's ark, screaming, can't you just let us in? All he could answer from the inside was, God shut the door and I don't have a key. No man can get you to heaven. Only the blood of Jesus can get you there. And if God closes your door, no man can open it. God is in charge. And God wants us today to make consecrations like we've never made before. You've heard me speak the last few weeks. I'm interested in changing nations. And, and, and I lose friends by somebody saying, we're going to send our young people over to give a witness on the street and hand out handbells. I, I, I almost get angry inside. I said, that's not, that's not for the last days. We'd have not talked to a few little people on the street. We'd have begin with the president. We'd have changed nations. This is the moment of changing nations. And this holy anointing, I don't know how it will come. I don't know whether you will be ready for it to come. I'm sure of one thing, if you have anger against somebody and if you're talking against some preacher, you won't get the anointing. We've got to clean up ourselves. We can't be like the old dirty church that got dirty through the ages by becoming worldly and become part of the new church, pure and clean. I want to be part of the new church. But Jesus as his head and go with him to the marriage supper of the Lamb and rejoice with him forever. And I want you to do the same. We have enough people here today to change a lot. Maybe we've got enough here to change the whole of America right now. And so let you and I read this again and again and, and let it get down inside of us. If you want to hear me say it, pick it up on a tape and, and say, I'm going to Keep listening to this thing. This is what God said for the last. Man didn't say it. It's not a sermon that was preached. It's a revelation to a very humble little person that after he got the revelation, he was not an old man. He might have been 40 when he's gone from off the face of the earth. God said, it's time to remove you. <laughs> you might become in charge of this and I don't want you in charge. The Holy Ghost is in charge and I don't want you in charge of it. Neither do I want you to have great financial remuneration because I spoke to you. I just want you to move aside now and you can come on home to heaven. And he was gone shortly after this. But he told this in a number of places. I started to tell you about Russia in the beginning of this thing. He went to Russia. He had no contacts. He went to a big factory and said, I'm from America, and I've come to talk to all your people. Call them together, please. They thought he was a government official. So they said, yes, sir. They called them all together. He says, I need an interpreter. 
They gave him a woman to interpret. He began to say, Jesus Christ is Lord of this country. And these people that preach atheism are a bunch of dirty liars going to hell. And the woman wouldn't say it. She said, Stalin is the savior of our land and he's the one that saves us. That was when Stalin was in power. And we looked to Stalin for everything that we need. He turned around and screamed, you're a dirty liar. He said it in Russian. And he preached, he preached for over an hour in the Russian language. And those people fell on their faces and sought God. And when they were through, they looked for him and they never found him. He was gone from that country. That was after the vision, you see, after the vision. We're now living in that beautiful moment. All of us should be so glad to be alive. Don't ever wish you were dead. Don't ever do that. Don't ever say, I'm sick unto death. Tell sickness to get out of you. You're waiting for the mighty move of God on the face of the earth. You're so excited about it. You don't want to mess with sickness. To stay out of your way. And so let's move into God. Let's move into the Spirit. Let's clean ourselves up. You see, you want us to do business? Do big business. Get all the money you can so you can send out the gospel everywhere you can. But it's not for you to can it and put it in the bank. It's for you to use it to save the world. We need so much to save this world today. Can you say amen?